couple of weeks ago, uh, we did a communion sermon where we paused. We were looking at a, at a book in, in Scripture where I always preach from. It's in 1 Corinthians. And we were looking at kind of what was happening in that church. Um, and if you recall, in that time, they were doing communion, but there were these meals, and people were eating with people they liked, and the rich people were eating together, and the poor people, they weren't doing anything. And some people were getting drunk, and, and all this stuff was happening. And Paul was, was correcting them in, in that moment, in that, in that act. Well, the book of Corinthians really is a pastoral letter for Paul, in which he's addressing a lot of problems that are happening in the church. It, it's, kind, it's kind of that, the, the fullness of that letter is really what he's doing. There's divisions in the church, there's disunity, there's, there's food sacrifice to idols, there's all the circumcision stuff, we're dealing with law, Gentiles, Jews, all this stuff. And so what we see is Paul is writing this letter to the church in Corinth. Is he's providing answers or pastoral advice to what they're facing. And so right there in the middle of that book is, is 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And, and Paul says these words, which I think sums up his desire for the church in Corinth. Because the problem is, is that this church is in disarray because there's, there's so many issues that they're facing. And they're all looking at each other and none of them know what to do. They're all looking at each other and they're all having problems with each other. And so Paul says here, here's my solution for you in the midst of what you're facing. Here's my solution for the chaos that is in your community. He says, why don't you follow my example as I follow the example of Christ? So we're, we're getting off kilter, we're getting all messed up, we're having terrible communion in, in the, the church, we don't like each other, there's problems, we're fighting over this, we're fighting over that, and Paul says, hey, follow me, as I follow Christ. And as I was thinking about Father's Day, what a challenging phrase for someone to say. What a humbling phrase for someone to say. What an accountable phrase for someone to say. Follow me as I follow Christ. You know, uh, Cam and I, I joke about our marriage sometimes. Too hard with her. Um, and, and, and the joke typically, or what we tend to say to people is, you know, don't do marriage like we do marriage. Because the way we do marriage probably won't work for you. Uh, because in our home, we're very physical. Uh, and, and, and I mean that by... We, we don't punch each other in anger, but we might punch each other. We probably pinch each other at times. We snap each other with towels. We shoot each other in the face with nerf guns. I mean, you know, we call each other geeks and dorks. And, and I tell people, you probably shouldn't do yours. My kids, like, if they don't marry the right person, they're going to end up in jail. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> can I be honest? And then I was challenged with how can you say, follow me, but... We don't follow me. Like, how can I stand up here and preach a sermon on follow me, but then say, hey, but don't follow me in this area of my life? And then I got to thinking, yeah, well, I might be physical with my life, but we love God and both we are. And we serve him with everything we have. And we do our best to make it a priority to be together, to spend time together. I have to word this the correct way. Sometimes, after a while, I try to apologize. <laughs> you know, we try to live in the church like we live in our home. We try to live with integrity and be as real as we possibly can. And so I was challenged with, yeah, I might say don't do your marriage the way I do, but, but there are aspects of my marriage in which, in which you absolutely can reflect that, that, that there are absolutely assets to others who are following me, that if my children have a marriage and have a home that is, is, is content or is, is, is as full as mine is, then they'll be completely satisfied and they'll be fulfilled in life. Like, that's what I hope for. You see, we live in a world that sometimes things look crazy. Now, when you look at this picture, do you see straight lines or crooked lines? Both. Yes or no? Or both? I see both. I wish my copper was here because I was going to tease him today and I was going to tell him I wanted to put a floor in my house that looks like this. 
because I can assure you without the proper tools, it's going to be impossible to put this floor in my house because as much as your brain wants to tell you they're not, every horizontal line on this, on this uh, grid or whatever you want to call it is absolutely straight. And the only way we can verify that is if we have a tool that's, that's straight because our brains tell us, man, there ain't no way those lines are straight. It looks like they go up and down and come this and that. And, 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 and that's the world in which we're living. That's the world that was the church in Corinth. They couldn't figure what straight lines were or what they were supposed to do. And so Paul says, hey, I'm going to be the tool that you can use to verify what is straight. If you can't find a square, Paul said, use my life. Follow me as I follow Christ. I'll say it again. How humble to say those words. One of the all-time great Christmas movies. It's coming again. I'm going to write a book one day, The Gospel, according to the Christmas story. And we're not talking about Jesus' birth right now. We come out, and everybody would be together, Ralphie. And you know what happens? They went and got their Christmas tree. Everything was great. They were singing Christmas carols in the car, and all of a sudden, pop on the side of the road. Remember this story? Ralphie's allowed to go out and help his dad. His dad thinks he's a NASCAR pit guy, and he's trying to do as fast as he possibly can. He puts all the lug nuts in the, in the hubcap, and Ralphie's holding that hubcap, and the dad, his arm comes up, and he hits that cap, and it shows those lug nuts flying through the air, and Ralphie says, Oh, budge. Remember that? The word? He didn't say that. He said the word. The big word. The queen mother of all the words. <laughs> and, and, and the scene goes and you know, gets in the car, mom screams, yells, whatever else, and they come home. And there's a really captivating scene when they get home. Because what's the first question mom wants to ask? Where did you hear that from? Where did you hear that from? And listen to Ralphie's words. See, follow me as I follow Christ. Now I've heard that word at least ten times a day from my old man. He worked for a family in the way other artists might work in oils and clays. He was his true medium, a master. But I chickened out and I said the first thing that came to mind, I said, Schwartz. Someone's following me. You know, this to this day is Father's Day, so I got some, some tools in the back. That I want the dad, you can take one home with you. You can have a, a framing square, or a speed square, or a level. Um, but the reality is, can you imagine? Uh, and I know I've heard some stories of people who have gone to do some rehab work, and, and it seemed as though the one who did the construction didn't know what a, a right angle was. Do you know what I'm talking about? We've all walked into houses where the walls look like this and the floors go like that. <coughs> And all of a sudden, the chaos gets more challenging because the square, the model, the framing tool in which we used, it wasn't perpendicular. It didn't. It, 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 it wasn't the, the angles that we needed to accomplish the work we were doing. And people started with a, a square that was a little off, and that square just kept getting further and further off, and all of a sudden, it's absolute chaos is all we see. You know, you've got to hang that last piece of drywall up and it takes Picasso to figure out how to cut it. Mike, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Nancy, don't laugh too much. It's Father's Day. We need squares to build. We need tools to help us know if it's level or not. We need something we can reference ourselves on or things with. You know, God, it says in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, you'll receive power 
when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, we read this in Sunday school. We all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory were being transformed into his image with an ever-increasing glory which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. We are the witnesses of Jesus Christ. We are the witnesses of the power of God, the Word of God that was made flesh and made his dwelling among us. We are the witnesses of the power of the cross of Jesus Christ. We are the witnesses of what he accomplished on Calvary. We're being transformed into his glory in how we live and who we are. What tool are you? Because I urge you, this is Romans chapter 12, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mer mercy to offer your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your proper, true and proper worship. Listen to what he says. Do not conform to the pattern of this world. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind and you'll be able to attest and approve what God's will is. His good and perfect, his pleasing will. Sorry, his pleasing and perfect will. The problem is society. The problem with, with our world, we live in a chaotic world, right? Uh, when I was in college, I took a class that's called Modern Geometry. Love for you to take it sometime. If you like geometry, you'll really love this. I hate geometry. You know, when we took geometry, it was an XY coordinate system. You had a flat thing that had lined up and down. What was your XY plane? This geometry said, we're going to throw out what you know, and we're going to make new truths. And so with the truths, we redefine the whole system. When you change the truth, you change the whole system. And so there were systems that they taught. And one of the systems was, rather than having your, your charts or your graphs on an XY coordinate plane, what if we were looking at things through the lens of a sphere? Like, that's the world. So suddenly the truth changed. X plus Y equals Z no longer was a straight line. It was now a curved line. And there was a different formula for a straight line in this system. The problem is we live in a world that's created multiple systems for how should function. Multiple truths for how things should be. But we have an absolute system that's the word of God, the truths or postulates that should govern us, that we should be living by. And when I say we, I'm not just talking to dads right now, I'm talking to everyone in this room. There's an absolute truth that we should be living by. It's not the pattern of this world. We're not conformed to the truths that they're telling us, but we're transformed by the renewing of our mind. We're transformed by Christ Jesus in us. You know what's the problem? We say, follow me, and people look at our lives, and they look at our mess. This is the ouch moment. And they say, why would I want to follow that? We look at our churches. We look at our pastors. Let me show this to what I talked about yesterday at the pool. This is where we're talking. Oh, I don't know that. We're being transformed by the renewing of our mind. We who with unveiled faces are reflecting what? The glory of God. When someone's near you, you should be a tool that they can see what the glory of God looks like. What it looks like to be a new creation in Christ Jesus. What it looks like to have hope for a resurrected life with Him for eternity. What it looks like to know that my sins are forgiven absolutely. What it looks like to have faith and confidence in a God who is with us, who will never leave us and forsake us. And I get it. At times we struggle, but that's when we need him. We need some prayer. We need love. You know, the crazy thing about love was, if you're one degree off, it doesn't take long to figure it out. You might not feel like you're that far off the mark here, but let's go down a mile down the road and see how far off you are.
My challenge, the challenge that Paul was speaking to Corinth, the challenge that I'm speaking to us, can we really say those words, follow me as I follow Christ? There's a story in the Old Testament, it's in the book of Isaiah, it's chapter 59, and it's in a season where the, the, the people of God, they've been in captivity, they've been, they've been, they've been uh, away, they were, they were dismissed, or they were removed from homes, they were taken by Babylon, they were in captivity. Uh, and there was a new king, King Cyrus became king, and he said, hey, all the, all, all the Israelites can come back, they can go back and, and have their land. And, and, and they were wrestling with some of them, they didn't want to come back, it says in that, in, in that scripture, they just wanted to stay where they were. They were pretty content with their captivity. You want to talk about an illustration for the world we live in? There's a lot of people that are pretty content with their captivity. And the prophet, he, he writes to them, and this is what he says. I'm going to read just a little bit from this. Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor his ear too dull to hear. But your iniquities, this is what was going on with the people of God. So they lost their square. Your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he will not hear. Your hands are stained with blood, your fingers with guilt, your lips have spoken falsely, and your tongue mutters wicked things. Who calls for justice? No one pleads a case with integrity. They rely on empty arguments, they utter lies, they conceive trouble and give birth to evil. They hatch the eggs of viper and spin a spider's web. Whoever eats their eggs will die, and when one is broken, the adder is hatched. I mean, this sounds like a great place to be, right? And the sad thing is, is I'm reading these verses, I'm wondering how far at times churches have come from the very words the prophet speaking right here. Their cobwebs are useless for nothing. They cannot cover themselves with what they make. Their deeds are evil uh, deeds. Their acts of violence are in their hands. Their feet rush to sin. They're swift to shed innocent blood. They pursue evil schemes. Acts of violence mark the ways, the way of peace it, that they uh, do not know is there is no justice in their path. They have turned into crooked roads. And no one walks along them. No one who walks along them will know peace. So justice is far from us. And righteousness does not reach us. We look for a light, but all is darkness. For brightness, we all walk in deep shadows. Like the blind we grow up along the wall, filling our way like people without eyes at midday. We stumble as if we're twilight uh, among the strong. We are like the dead. The prophet is saying that here's the situation. It is so dark where you're at. It is so broken where you're at. Straight roads have become crooked roads, and people are following something. They're following someone. Even in the darkness, they're clinging for some reality. And really, this prophet, this, this verse, this chapter in, in, in Scripture is a call to, to the people of God that they need a standard. said, I need a standard. I can interpret that one. But we live in a world that absolutely needs a standard. We live in a home that need a standard. We live in a community that needs a standard. They need to be able to look at someone. They need light to come in the midst of darkness. They need us to be who God has called us to be. His witnesses, witnesses of the power of Jesus Christ. That's what the, the, the people of Israel need. That's what the people of today need. They need someone. They need someone. They need sons. They need daughters. They need men. They need women. They need children that will rise up and be a standard for Him. That's an amen moment. My kids need standard bearers in their lives. My kids need standard bearers at home. They need standard bearers at school. They need standard bearers who are their friends. lifting it up. And how will people follow? 
If no one is choosing to be the image of Christ, to reflect the glory of God that comes from Him, to be transformed by God, and rather than be conformed to the pattern of this world, if we're not willing to say that, then how can we say, follow me as I follow Christ? Because a lot of times we're saying, follow me, but we're leaving that last part off. Follow me. I will tell you, there's someone following you. I don't care who you are in this room, there is absolutely someone who is following you. It's easy to look at pastors and say, hey, pastors, you know, we read verses that says that there's an accountability for, for the position, there's an accountability that God has, a standard that he has, but body of Christ, there's someone following you. There's someone who is using you as their God. There's someone who's measuring up and you're wondering, hey, hey, Jay, have your kids ever put your shoes on, Jason? Okay, say, hey son, the way I dealt with that situation, I wasn't meeting the mark that God intended for me. My wife already knows it, so I don't have to tell her. She's already told me several times. <laughs> Usually, it gets enough, but it really makes it a lot better. If you know what I'm saying. I want to read. This is where I'm going to conclude. Uh, it's in Colossians chapter three. And it's funny, when it comes to Father's Day, there's some verses in the book of Colossians that we often think about. And, and, and they're great verses. Um, it says, Wives, submit to your husbands, and spirit the Lord. Husbands, love your wives, and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents and everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not embitter your children, or they'll become discouraged. And it talks about slaves, obey your masters. And, and, and sometimes we focus on those words, those are the what's. But there's a whole lot that came before that in that chapter. There was a whole lot that came before simply husbands honor your wives and, and you know, or husbands love your wives and, and wives submit to your husband. I mean, there's a whole lot that comes before that at times we don't even look at because we like those verses or, or we want to talk about them. But look at what it says leading up to this. There's something in us in aligning ourselves with the will of God. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual morality, impurity, lust, evil desires, greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways, the life you must live, but now you must rid yourselves of all these things. And your rage, malice, tender, filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other since you've taken off your old self with its practices and you put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge of the image of its creator. Here there is no Jew or Gentile, uh, no circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all. It is in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion and kindness and humility and gentleness and patience. This sounds a little bit like Sunday school, uh, but bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has any grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. Over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them together, all together in perfect unity, and let the peace of Christ rule your hearts. Since as members of one body, you were called to peace and be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell richly or among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs or songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your heart. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. 
And then, wives, submit to your husbands. And then, husbands, love your wives. How? This is the how. This is the practice I need in my life. I need to put death to, to death things in me. I need to put to death things that work. I need to acknowledge sin. I need to ask for forgiveness. I need to repent. I need to move forward in my life. I need to clothe myself daily, probably minute by minute, with compassion, with humility, with kindness. I need to put on the love of God. I need to be transformed. This is what this is. It's all about transformation. And when I live in Colossians chapter 3, it helps me not embitter my children. It helps me to be a, a guide in which they can look at to see if they're in alignment or out of alignment, to see if they're, they're level or out of level. You guys can come forward. I don't have to do that. I know I want to say this. Dwayne was teasing me before church. Dwayne, I'm talking about you now. You can pay attention. <laughs> Dwayne, you were teasing me before church. And he said, Pastor, I've got all those tools. He said, Pastor, I've got all those tools. He said, I've got like three of them. It's almost like he wanted a candy bar and stack or something this morning. The lady's got candy bars. He wanted one. But here's going to be my challenge. I want every, every dad, every man, every, every person, if you've got a man in your life, you can take it to him. Um, I want you to take one of those tools home. And if you've already got one, then give it to someone else who doesn't know how to use it and show them how to use it. You're saying, but that's who we are. Follow, follow me. Follow, follow my example. Is I'm following the example of Christ. Follow me in the way I'm living my life for Him, in the way I've surrendered, in the way I've witnessed, in the way I've acknowledged what God has done. Follow me as I follow Christ. Father, we come to you this morning. In those words of Paul. God, I ask that they would resonate with us. And God, the words wouldn't just be follow me, follow me, follow me. But God, it may be that follow me as I follow the example of Christ. God, this morning as we as we as we're here, I pray the Spirit of God speaks to us, to our hearts, men, women, children, and reveals those skewed angles in our lives. Yeah. 
we could have the desires of our heart. As a father, my desire is that my children will know you with all. That they'll serve you with all. That they won't become disenfranchised by a truth that wasn't the same a church as it was in all God. Transform my life. Realign my life so I can walk at home as I do the church. But in all ways, they're seeing a truth, the absolute truth of the product of Jesus Christ. A new creation. Transform. Empower. Reflecting your glory. God, I pray that not just for my home, but for every home in this room. God, I pray that we live in such a way that the, that the kingdom of God, the truth of your kingdom is revealed where we are. I pray that we live in such a way that, that our children, that our grandchildren, that our, that, our, that, our, that our friends, our co-workers can look at our lives and see a standard. They can see light in the midst of darkness. They can realize that their captivity is not worth because God's got something greater. Pray, God, that we will be tools in your hands. We will be tools in this world. In Jesus' name. As they us in this course, I do want to take a chance to open up the altars. If you want to come to the altar and pray for a little bit, the altars are open. Father's Day. Be blessed. Amen. Amen. God is good.